life for a pig? And that's something that we get asked all the time. I used to go to work pulling rabbits out of hats as I was a professional magician, and Steve, he was a real estate agent. But everything, and I mean everything, changed one day when Steve got a message on Facebook asking if he wanted a mini pig. I always considered myself an animal lover. I've been drawn to them since I was a little boy. So I'm sure most of our friends weren't surprised when I went home unannounced with a mini pig. Derek, however, he was furious. It took him a few weeks to even warm up to the idea of keeping her, but during those first couple of weeks, we saw an incredible personality developing. We had no idea how similar pigs were to a puppy, but one thing in particular really stuck out to us, and that's just how intelligent she was. Within a few days of arriving, Esther found one of the dog's treat balls. Now, they had them for years, and they'd play for a few minutes, but they'd get it stuck somewhere, or they'd get bored, and then they'd move on with it. Esther, however, she would take that ball and walk in a straight line from one end of the room to the other until it was empty. It was incredible. She was super curious, too. She had to explore anything that was new or out of place, so anytime a guest came over, if they left their coat or their purse within reach, it was fair game as far as Esther was concerned. The more interested she was, the more money I'd be willing to wager that there was chapstick or a pack of gum in one of the pockets. I resisted at first. I, I even refused to give her a name. I called her Kajiji after the online auction site that I had intended to list her for sale on. <laughs> Kinda half joking, uh, but it wasn't long before and I was falling for her too. I, I was practicing magic in the living room one day, as I often would, and Esther took an interest into what I was doing. So I went and I got a cookie and I made it disappear. Now I did it all the time for the dogs and they would bark and wag their tails like crazy. It was pretty funny, but uh, I, I wish I had a video camera for Esther's reaction because you could literally see the wonder and amazement in her eyes as the cookie disappeared. I did the trick one more time, anticipating the same hilarious results, yet this time Esther started sniffing around behind me. You see, she knew where the cookie was. <laughs> You know, the dogs, they could be fooled over and over and over again, but not Esther. The term pig pen also came to mind when I met Esther, uh, because I thought that she was going to be a smelly, stinking mess all the time, but, you know, she was surprisingly clean. She had a bed uh, in her pen with her litter box, and she almost always kept that clean. I'm not going to pretend that she kept a 100% perfect potty record, but teaching her to use the litter box, that was not the problem. She got along really well with our other animals, too. It was hilarious to see her try to fit in that pack. All that she wanted to do was just follow them around. It, it was hilarious. Uh, one, lingering, one lingering fact remained, however, was that we lived in a part of town that wasn't zoned to allow mini pigs. So we had to keep her quiet from the neighbors. Uh, we found an out-of-town vet that would see her, and we thought that we were all in the clear until the vet dropped the bombshell. I went alone to our first appointment with the vet, and it was probably a good thing, because among the first words out of his mouth were, mini pig, eh? I'm afraid you got a commercial pig on your hands here, Steve. I nearly died. How could something so small, so cute, and so smart be the same thing I ate for breakfast two days earlier? It turns out her cropped tail is a clear indication to any knowledgeable person. It's common practice on commercial farms to cut off pigs' tails, it's often done without any pain medication, using basically a pair of pliers. It was my first introduction to what life could have been like for Esther, and it was upsetting to say the least. Keep in mind at this point, we hadn't even discussed the fact that she would be 250 pounds or more. That is substantially bigger than the 70 pounds I'd been led to believe by the girl I got her from. When Steve came home, he totally downplayed the information that he shared with me. When he started with, well... I knew I should have probably sat down. It turns out she's going to be a little bit bigger than we thought, he said. Okay. Uh, maybe 200 to 250 pounds. Oh, 
Okay, that's not so bad. And it turns out she's not a mini pig, she's a commercial pig. A million things were going through my mind in that moment. Most of them were swear words. And I had just come to terms with the fact that we were going to keep her. And this was a huge setback, literally. Uh, we did some soul searching for a couple of days, but animals have a way of stealing your heart. And even though we had only known Esther for a few weeks, we both couldn't stand the thought of giving up on her. We carried on for months with nothing more than hope that she wouldn't get as big as we knew she could. But every time somebody came over, it was the same thing. Oh my gosh, she is huge. How big is she going to get? What are you guys going to do with her? It was all the same things that we were asking ourselves, and that's actually why we call her Esther the Wonder Pig. But aside from her astonishing rate of growth, which was almost a pound a day at its quickest, her intelligence was becoming increasingly apparent. Our freezer was below the fridge. We had to keep it taped closed all the time with box tape, or es Esther would be in there. We had childproof locks on our cupboards, and they worked for a few days, and that was about it. By the time Esther was six or seven months old, she could open every single door in our house. She would use her snout to operate lever-style door handles. Even giving her medication was a battle of wits, because no matter how well we thought we hid those pills, she would find and reject them. Sometimes she would even make me think she'd swallow all of them, so I'd give her a cookie only to spit one out after the fact. <laughs> she was a little Houdini. She could read our minds as well. She was always one step ahead of us. One of the most amazing displays of thoughtfulness that I ever witnessed from Esther was when she concocted this whole plan to steal food from the cupboards. Typically, she would steal whatever she wanted as quickly as possible, pulling a Hail Mary, and she realized that that would get her into trouble. So she started breaking it down into steps. She started opening the cupboard very quietly when nobody was around. She would circle back around to the living room to get an eye on us to make sure that everything was okay. She'd go back into the kitchen, she'd pull the basket up very slowly for what she wanted. Then she'd go back into the living room and check on us one more time. She'd go back into the kitchen, grab her prize, haul ass down to the bedroom so she could eat it. You know, she had broken that down into steps, being as quiet as possible to avoid detection. And uh, as annoying as that was, uh, there was no denying that there was something special going on in that big head of hers. It really felt like we were battling with a two-year-old sometimes. And in many ways we were. Science has proven that pigs can be as smart as human toddlers. They excel at video games, using their snout to operate the joystick. And they're among only a handful of animals that have been shown to recognize themselves in mirrors. Pigs are astonishingly intelligent, so it was amazing for us to watch her grow up and experience the world around her. We definitely had our fair share of laughs, but I would be lying if I didn't say we had our fair share of headaches. We went through thousands of dollars in torn beds and bedding. She even broke an iPad once when I left it on the couch and she decided she wanted to take a nap on it. We had toilet training issues, too, when she became too big for any practical litter box to handle, and we had to start telling her to go outside. Now, you might think trying to undo months of toilet training would be hard enough, not when you're dealing with an Esther. Esther added an entirely different layer of difficulty by fake peeing when we took her out. You see, we tried to teach her just like you would with a puppy, right? So we'd get, take her outside as often as we could, we'd encourage her to pee, get really excited when she did it, and we'd give her a cookie. So when she started asking to go by herself, and more frequently, we thought it was amazing. Until we realized that most of the time, she didn't even pee. She would face us a few feet away, squat for a few seconds, and then come running to us for our cookie. She totally played us, and we felt like complete idiots compared to her sometimes. All of that, combined with the fact that she was getting larger each day, uh, having grown past 250 pounds before her first birthday, that made for some pretty trying times. Um, and trying to find a home for a pig like Esther, well, that's next to impossible. And the thought of just sending her off to some farm, well, that was unthinkable. We loved Esther the way that we loved our dogs and cats, and we were going to see it through no matter what we needed to do. Aside from adapting our lifestyle to accommodate Esther in the house, we had both never really been able to shake the fact that Esther was a commercial pig. Uh, 
getting to know Esther made us want to know more about where she came from, so we started to do a little bit of research into the animal agriculture industry in general. Uh, we watched a few documentaries and we found out some pretty crazy things, like number one, that animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gases than planes, trains, and automobiles combined and that it's the leading cause of habitat destruction, species extinction, ocean dead zones, water pollution, disease, and way too many other things to go into these moments that we have today. Either way, we learned enough that we didn't want to be a part of that anymore, so we adopted what we call an Esther-approved lifestyle, <laughs> and we gladly stopped consuming animal products altogether. We had finally accepted the fact that this was our new normal, and we had come to a place where we thought we could share what life with a wonder pig was like with our more removed friends and family. Remember, we lived in a part of town where it was illegal to have her, so we had done a really good job of keeping her off our own social media pages. But we decided we would start a dedicated Facebook page for Esther. Little did we know, that page would go viral. We started getting messages from people all over the world that were basically retelling us our own story. I had no idea how smart pigs were. I'll never look at them the same way. I don't think I can eat bacon anymore. It was incredible, and they were coming in by the hundreds. The page was still really, really new, so Derek and I were trying to figure out where we fit in, and we decided we'd take a more vegan approach to our messaging on the page, but we couldn't have been more wrong. Almost immediately, people started fighting, because somebody would come on the page and say, oh my gosh, I'm falling in love with Esther. I'm never gonna be able to eat bacon again. And then the vegan police would jump in and say, well, what about cows and what about chickens? And you're hardly an animal lover if you still eat cows and chickens. It drove us crazy. We had seen in the early weeks of Esther's Facebook page that she was having an effect on people with, without any vegan messaging. So, and we knew that we could have a bigger impact on non-vegans, so they became our target audience. We realized that creating a meaningful relationship between Esther and her new friends using cute, funny photos was almost always more powerful than going, you need to change, or by showing them some horrific images. You know, we didn't change because somebody yelled at us or showed us something really horrifying. We changed because we got to know what those products were by literally living with one in our house. See, we didn't see bacon anymore. We saw Esther. And that's what we were trying to replicate on our social media pages. So we dedicated every spare moment of our time to answering emails, questions, comments, and helping people, you know, uh, relate with her on a very personal level. We were putting ourselves out there in a serious way. We had newspapers coming, the news media was coming, Esther was everywhere, and we knew it was only a matter of time before the town came knocking and told us that we had to go. Now, during one of our low points the previous summer, when Derek and I weren't even sure if we were gonna be able to keep Esther, we learned that there were places called farm sanctuaries that rescue abandoned and abused farm animals. But many of these places are struggling for funding or volunteers or they're overflowing with animals. So we started thinking, well, what if we opened our own farm sanctuary? All of a sudden, we had all of these people that were expressing an interest in us and what we were doing and of course, had fallen in love with Esther. So we thought, well, why not buy a farm? Well, we couldn't afford it, to be totally honest with you. We lived in one of the most expensive real estate markets in Canada. We also had jobs to consider, so we couldn't just pack up and move north to become farmers. So we started a crowdfunding campaign with a ridiculously ambitious fundraising goal of $400,000. Somehow, we did it. In 60 days, we raised $440,000 and were able to purchase a farm in Campbellville, Ontario and established Happily Ever Esther Farm Sanctuary in November of 2014. When Esther arrived at the farm, she was nervous at first, but as soon as she saw the dog, she walked straight off. She got so much joy just from being able to do whatever she wanted to do and go wherever she wanted to go, and we got to see her run full out for the first time. Since then, managing Esther's social media following in the sanctuary, that's become a full-time job for the both of us, but why? Why would we allow that to happen? It's because Esther elevated pigs to a position that we had previously only held for our companion animals. Yes, Esther is funny and cute and smart. She's all of those things, but so is every pig, and that's the problem. 
while Esther was at home sleeping on her bed or swimming in her pool or playing with us in the backyard, her litter mates were locked in dark barns on concrete floors without access to the outdoors, access to light or anything to do. They would be taken away at about six to eight months for processing, but not the unlucky females. Esther's sister, maybe even Esther herself, could have become a breeding sow and spent up to three years producing litter after litter after litter of piglets. She would be confined to a small cage not larger than her body, about six and a half feet by two feet, so small that she can't even turn around. All she can do is stand up and sit down. Her piglets, the love that they would know from mom is when she sang to them as she nursed. Yeah, pigs do sing to their young as they nurse, just like humans do. Uh, the pigs would be removed at about three to four weeks of age so that mom could be re-impregnated again to restart that whole vicious process again. She would literally be driven into madness through lack of activity and depression. I think about Esther's birth family all the time. I remember our trip to the farm and how nervous and scared she was in that trailer, even though Derek and I were with her the entire time. I couldn't help but wonder if that was the day that her sister would be taking a ride in the trailer too. You see, Esther was about two and a half when we moved. And that's really consistent with the life expectancy of a breeding sow in commercial operations. So my mind started to wander and I fixated on that. And I started to wonder what her day might have looked like. She would have been loaded onto a trailer with up to 200 other scared and confused pigs where they could legally spend up to 36 hours on the road without any food or water in any type of weather. Upon arrival at the slaughterhouse, they would be sent into cages using electric prods and be lowered into gas chambers to be humanely stunned prior to slaughter. The agriculture industry wants you to think that they don't feel a thing, but they literally fight until their very last breath. That could have been Esther. We believed myths of free range and humane meat and told ourselves that those crazy videos, they don't happen here, that's gotta be from a different country. But we were wrong. And it does happen here, it happens everywhere. We just spend our whole lives trying to ignore it and looking the other way when one of those trucks drive by on the highway. So that's why we dedicate our lives to a pig, because Esther made us stop looking the other way and she made us realize that we can do better. We couldn't possibly know what life could have been like for Esther and the impacts that animal agriculture is having to the world around us and pretend that we're okay with that. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And Esther definitely changed the way that we look at things. A pig that was born to be our dinner had become an integral part of our family. And when your food has a face, a name, and a personality, you'll never be able to look at it the same way again. So we, we took possession of the farm on November the 6th, 2014. And when we first got to the farm, and, and I have to tell you this, this was less than a year after we started Esther's Facebook page did that farm come to fruition. When we, were, when we, uh, were, when we arrived at the farm, uh, it was about 20 to 25 years unmaintained. Uh, the folks that lived there prior to us, it, uh, they operated a cattle farm, but uh, it was about 20 years from when they ended the farming of cattle and to when we purchased the property. So there was an absolute ton of cleanup to go on. Uh, the farm felt really, really small. All the edges of the forests had grown in and all of the deadfall had made the farm feel really, really small. There were about, there was probably about five or six years worth of work for Stephen and I to do in order to get the property ready for visitors, but we had all of you on our side. We called for volunteers and everybody came running from all corners of the globe. It was a really amazing experience to get that farm all tidied up. Uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had a day called Get Dirty and that was our initial cleanup day at the farm. And we had about 200 folks that came running from everywhere and it was an amazing experience. Uh, we, we had fencing to do as well. At the farm, when we arrived, there was very little to no fencing at all. Uh, the only fences that remained were the rock walls that were there, and of course the rock walls were not everywhere, so we had a whole pile of work to do. I didn't realize that opening a farm sanctuary meant that you needed to be a pro-fencer, uh, but uh, we definitely have those skills underway now. 
we spent basically the whole winter uh, putting up fences and getting ready for the new residents. Before we even took possession of the farm, we had given our commitment to two other residents, uh, BJ and Escalade. BJ and Escalade are horse and donkey. Escalade is the horse, BJ is the donkey. And uh, we got contacted by a couple very close to us uh, geographically, and uh, both of them, uh, both of their previous care owners, unfortunately fell terribly ill, um, and uh, they had to concentrate on you know, uh, looking after themselves, and they didn't have the resources to manage BJ and Escalade anymore. So we agreed before having a farm, before having, uh, before knowing where their feet were going to be, we agreed that we uh, that we could help them as soon as uh, as soon as possible. Uh, BJ and Escalade they arrived uh, within a couple of weeks, so we had to put up uh, fencing where there was no fencing to get ready for them. Read a whole bunch of books like Horses for Dummies and Farming for Dummies uh, in preparation to get ready for those guys to come. The learning curve when we got to the farm was incredibly fast, and we got a message about these three guys uh, about a month and a half after we arrived at the sanctuary. This was an incredible lesson for us, not only because we had never met cows before until the day they literally arrived in one of our pastures, uh, but these guys came from a sanctuary that was no longer able to sustain itself. So we had no sooner got onto this farm, we were starting to get our fences sorted out and kind of get our feet on the ground, did we get a phone call from a lady about five hours away from us, letting us know that there was a sanctuary out there that was struggling beyond belief. The condition for the animals had deteriorated, they weren't getting fed properly. Um, the money was potentially being taken from the sanctuary and being used in places that it shouldn't have been used. It was a really messy situation. Um, but by no fault of the lady who was running the sanctuary, this lady was in her late 70s to early 80s and had been doing this for the better part of her life. Um, she didn't have anybody to help her. Her husband had passed away and there was no succession plan in place. So what happened is she got to this point where she just couldn't do it anymore. She had spent her whole life taking care of these guys and had to slowly start passing them off to other sanctuaries so that we could see them through the rest of their lives. So we welcome Denver, uh, Jasmine, Pouty Face, and four pigs. Bear, Leonard, that's Bobby down here, and Captain Dan in the bottom left-hand corner. They joined us about two months after we moved to the farm. Um, and they forced us to kick things into really high gear to get prepared for them. We assumed that we would have the winter to get settled with Esther and to get things organized for BJ and Escalade, and that by springtime we would start welcoming new residents. We had no idea how severe the issue is of sanctuaries not preparing um, for succession plans um, and being financially stable enough to run themselves without interjection from, from other volunteers and supporters. Um, it was a real eye-opener for us, um, and something that Derek and I now spend a whole lot of time working, working on and focusing on. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to come up with very unique and interesting fundraising methods. I'm not sure how many of you guys follow the farm and follow Esther and see kind of the way that we operate and do things, um, but we come at it from a very different perspective, a big part of it because of these guys. Um, because we are determined to make sure that Happily Ever Esther Farm Sanctuary lasts long after Derek and I are able to take care of it and run the farm ourselves. We've established it, we've started the sanctuary, um, but we will definitely not be the last people to run Happily Ever Esther. Um, it's something that a lot of people overlook. Um, they, they get into this whole idea of, oh, I want to save and I want to rescue animals, and that's exactly how we started too. Um, thankfully, we had people around us that made sure that we thought about these other things. Um, and one piece of advice for anybody out here that is thinking about starting a farm sanctuary um, is to go into it with sustainability um, and succession plans in mind. Because you are taking in all of these animals, when you go, all of a sudden those animals need homes too. Um, and that is a huge issue in the sanctuary world. One of the most interesting uh, aspects of maintaining and running the sanctuary is just how unique each and every resident is we get a chance to figure them out. You know, we, most of them we have never met uh, before, and when they arrive at the sanctuary, they're having a lot of experiences for the first time. We have some animals that, uh, that maybe have never touched grass on their feet before. They are what, we, what I call a concrete animal. They've only been on concrete pad for their entire life. So touching the grass for the first time is a unique experience, and quite often they back up because they're scared of it. 
Some of the animals, when they arrive too, we always have baskets of fresh fruit and vegetables for them and the best foods, but you know what? They don't know what that is. Some of these animals have never eaten a fresh fruit or vegetable in their lives. Some of them have never grazed grass. They don't know even what that is. So it's a really unique experience to grow with the animals and get to know them and uh, get to have these experiences with them. Pigs. Pigs have a real bad rap. And uh, I'm here to dispel a few of those myths. Uh, we get messages by the hundreds every week to Esther's Facebook page, and some of them go, you have a pig in your house? Is that so smelly and stinky and gross? You know, we get accosted from all angles, but let me tell you something about the smell of a pig. The smell of a pig, it's a really, really sweet aroma. Uh, Esther and the female pigs, they all have this, this aroma around them of like maple syrup or brown sugar. Sometimes it smells a bit celery saltish. If you've ever tried to describe a smell, it's very difficult. But if you ever get a chance to smell a female pig, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so do pigs stink? Yes, they do, but it's a nice stink. It's not a dirty stink. <laughs> Pigs are a product of their environment. Most times people see pigs in a big pig pen with 25 other pigs in like a, if we were to make this a 12 by 12 stall here, if this was a, a, a stall in a barn, 12 by 12 stall, this would have about 25 pigs in it. And those 25 pigs would be raised from about 15 weeks to six or eight months of age, and then at which point they would be taken away for processing. But during that time, that's the space that they would have. That's the footprint that they would have. No access to outdoors. Pigs are one of the cleanest animals in the world, and let me tell you, that would drive them crazy to have to go to the bathroom indoors. Our pigs at the farm, when the doors are open, they all go outside to use the washroom. They do not go to the washroom inside. We did not teach them that. That's just, that's their species. They don't want to go to the bathroom where they sleep. So that must just be torture for them to have to do that. So they're a product of their environment. So if you smell 25 pigs in a stall like this, they are going to be smelly. That is for sure because they are just, you know, they're going to the washroom right where they have to do everything else. So do pigs stink? No, they do not. Are pigs angry and mean? And uh, no, they're not at all. They're gentle giants. Again, a stall this big with 25 pigs in it, not able to get away from each other, yeah, they're going to be mean towards each other. They're going to be cross. Some of them might even be suffering insanity, or some of them might be suffering depression. But any species, when put into an environment like that, would suffer those same things as well. Can animals feel? Absolutely. Nothing drives me more bananas than when someone says, dumb farmed animals, they can't feel, they're just produced for food. You know, they do feel. They feel everything that we do. They can anticipate, they can feel joy, they can feel happiness, they can be depressed, they can be sad, they can have all of those feelings that we do, and they can certainly suffer. So, are pigs dirty? They are the cleanest animal, they're one of the cleanest animals in the world, but they roll in the mud. It's called wallowing. They use their nose and they dig a hole in the ground and then they hope that it fills up with rainwater and it produces mud and then they can roll in it. Well, they roll in it, not because they want to be dirty, they roll in it because uh, they need a little bit of sunscreen protection, maybe. You know, pig skin, just like our skin, will burn and blister up in the sun. They can get the same skin cancers that we can get. So, as a natural response to the environment, they roll in mud. Another reason why they might roll in mud is uh, to prevent any bugs from biting. So, thick mud will, you know, if you've got bugs out, uh, the bugs can't bite through the mud. Another thing that pigs use to get rid of the flies is their tail, but on industrialized farms we know that the tail is cut off. They cut the tail off because when they're living in a small environment like this and they can't get away from each other and they start suffering insanity and all these other symptoms, they get cross with each other and they all bite each other. And usually the last thing to leave the scene is the tail. The tail is the last thing to leave the area and so the tail will get chomped on. And uh, an injured pig is not very economical if you're raising pigs for their flesh. Um, so rather than give the pigs more space or something to do or the ability to get outside, we disarm them by cropping their tail and sometimes cutting out their teeth. Uh, so pigs, are they cross? Are they angry? No, they're not. But again, any species in that environment is going to be cross and angry. So those are usually the only experiences when people actually get to see 
a real live pig is on an industrialized farm. Chickens, oh my goodness. I knew nothing about chickens before the farm, and I know a lot now about chickens, and I'm learning so much more about them. If you've ever heard somebody call somebody a bird brain, consider that a compliment. Birds are incredibly smart. Uh, this is Richard on the left, your right, and this is Heisenberg, or Lady Heisenhen. Uh, <laughs> these guys are amazing. Uh, we have a small coop. And uh, we have two roosters and a bunch of hens that the roosters keep busy. The roosters play a really important role in the coop. I had no idea uh, just what they do. It's pretty amazing. Richard is such a giver. He's a real giver. What he'll do is he, he's the first one out of the coop every morning and he has to turn around and show you his beauty when he comes out and he has to chat you up and he will find you something. He will go into the coop and he will find you something. Whether it be something shiny on the ground or a really nice piece of grass, he'll find it. He'll make this noise like he's got it for you. And you'll see all the hens come when he makes this noise. And it's actually Richard finding food for them. Richard has a very, very important responsibility. The male finds the food for the hens. He won't eat it for himself. He could find a really delicious worm or a really delicious seed, and he will not eat it. Totally reserved, he beckons for the women, and they come and they eat it. It's an amazing thing. Uh, they have all sorts of uh, unique calls that are specific to the birds. Um, they, they are, they are, uh, they really open my eyes. Uh, the, the chickens amaze me every single day. The chickens can recognize up to a hundred different unique faces. Chickens are as smart as three, four-year-old school children. They know colors, they know shapes, and again, they can experience all of the emotions that we can. Again, being at Happily Ever Esther has been a really amazing eye-opening experience for us. It's been a little over three years, about three and a half years since all of this started. Um, and, and when we look back and, and how it happened and why it happened, it's a really mind-boggling situation. What has happened with us in the last few years would have been impossible ten years ago. Social media changed everything, not only about our lives, but in its ability to help and to do things for animals. Esther is making connections with people, like we said, all around the world. People that we would never ever have the opportunity to speak to. Uh, social media allows us to get into people's faces in a way that was never possible before, and when used correctly, can be an incredibly powerful tool for changing the world and, and for making positive changes in every aspect of our life. As of right now, we've got about 47 residents that live at the farm. We welcomed over 2,000 volunteers to our property from over 40 countries all over the world last year. And again, none of it would have been possible without Facebook. We're going to be talking a little bit more about how we use social media um, tomorrow. So if you're in the area, come on back for our talk tomorrow, you'll hear that too. Um, like I said, social media changed everything for us. Happily Ever Esther uh, will be celebrating its third anniversary in December of this year. And it is just the beginning for us. We are so excited. We are so happy to be here. We thank you very much for coming to listen, guys. And we've got a few minutes for questions now as well. Thank, thank you. you so much.